Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Niall. I run a company called uh, Everything. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a serial offender in terms of building tech companies. There we go. Um, so I thought what I'd do is, is try and provide some insights into how I think about the innovation and, and, and business creation uh, process. Um, insight into my thinking might be a scary thing, but uh, nonetheless. So everything is, uh, is, is, is uh, about what, three and a half years old now, based here in New York, um, in London, and in San Francisco, um, as the name may suggest, in the Internet of Things um, environment. Um, and specifically, it's about making, making products smart, but managing the data from and about these products actually um, uh, make them work in the broader context of the web. So examples like um, iHome Smart Plug, um, you know, how, does that, how, how is the back end of that actually operated in the sense of the data from about that product? How is it interconnecting with lots of different applications? Um, you know, the button on the bottom right there, or the device on the bottom right there is a Dom Perignon uh, a smart button, so it's an incredibly elaborate device, but basically what it lets you do is uh, order a 500 buck bottle of Dom Perignon if you're staying in an expensive enough hotel by hitting the button, or praying that your girlfriend doesn't hit the button in the, in the hotel room, as the case may be. Um, or other devices, like, uh, like a Johnny Walker bottle there on the bottom left that's carrying a, a sensor device to determine whether it's been open or closed, um, and, uh, and therefore you know, battling anti-counterfeit. Um, it's an NFC connected device in that particular case. But the common issue here is how to manage the data from and about these products, um, basically how to connect these products to the web. And that's, uh, that's the arena that everything's, that everything's addressing. We're um, Atomico, uh, Cisco, um, our, uh, our, our, our key investors, um, a venture capital company called Dawn out of, out of London, uh, and some other private equity investors here in New York. Um, Samsung as a, as a strategic investor in the company as well. Um, as I said, we're about three years old. But the context that, that in, in creating everything that, that really interested me was this concept that as, as physical products become digitally connected things, they, uh, they need to connect into the broader environment of the, of the digital ecosystem. And, and, uh, and that concept of really thinking about products moving from a context of being um, standalone, isolated objects to a context of being part of the, of the digital ecosystem um, is a thought process behind the origin of the company. Um, and Bruce Sterling said this wonderful thing, like, how do I Google my shoes and I can't find them? Which uh, I, I, I think is a, a, like a great challenge because it, it, it talks to a world where we've got to a level playing field between digital content and, uh, and, and the information from and about our physical products. If you can Google your shoes and you can ask them where they are, uh, what they are, you can understand the relationship between Bruce and his, and his shoes. Um, what you're getting to is an environment where we've made physical products uh, a, 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 an equivalent part of the digital landscape. So that, you know, that, that says that physical products have to have an avatar on the web, they have to become part of the, of the, of the native web environment. And, and that's, uh, that's, I guess, inspired the technology that we put behind everything. But really, um, that amounts to an identity for, for physical things on the web. And, uh, and that's our root technology, really. Software objects that correspond to physical objects and therefore manage the information from and about a physical object, make it possible for physical objects to be dynamically connected with applications, with other objects, with human beings, and so on in, in the context of the web. But that, the, 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 the creation of everything um, um, arises from a, a com common process um, of, of innovation that I've, I've had over the last several years, which I, I talk about sort of thinking backwards. And you know, when, we, when we have insights and we create businesses, we often think quite progressively about the environment that we're developing into. Um, and uh, you know, I tend to think of the Greg Rosetsky expression, which is kind of skate to where the puck's going to be. Um, and this notion of thinking backwards from a future state of the market environment. So the environment that, that everything's operating in is, is basically operating on an assumption that there's inevitability to every physical product in the world becoming digitally, a digitally connected, a digitally active thing. And in that context, uh, you know, what, are the, what are the services, what are the requirements of that, of that environment? And therefore, let's engineer a business that is 
is going to be delivering in that, in that future state of the market space. Obviously, there's an uncertainty as to what the timetable is between you know, the current state of market and that future state of market. Uh, and, and clearly, we need to, we need to uh, get it right as to when timing peaks. But that concept of, of thinking backwards from a, from a future market state is really what I've applied in, in every business that I've created. Whoops, jump backwards a little bit. Just a little background on myself. So, um, yeah, I, I, I'm uh, the accent's South African. I, I, I grew up in South Africa. I'm originally Irish. I'm not quite sure what my national identity is at this point. Um, live here in New York right now. My first venture was an internet service provider back in 1994, which is probably before half of the people in this room were born. Um, and uh, um, was, uh, was one of the first ISPs in Africa. Um, you know, involved pulling a, a massive 768 kilobits of, uh, of fiber optic capacity into, into Cape Town, which seemed like a hell of a lot at that, at that point in time. Um, and I sold that business to, to UUNet in, in 1998. Um, after that, in, uh, in, in Europe, in, uh, in London actually, I founded a company called The Cloud, which is a, a public Wi-Fi network operator acquired by uh, News Corporation in, in 2010, and it's the, the largest public Wi-Fi network operator in, uh, in, in Europe. Um, and then, uh, um, much to my wife's annoyance, subsequently founded everything in, in 2011 um, as, a, as the next adventure in the Internet of Things. But the formative experience for me was in South Africa in the, in the, uh, in the early 90s. Um, and I was very fortunate to be involved in, in a political process and specifically in the task of, of creating the information technology policy for South Africa between 1992 and 1994 um, when the ANC moved into government in, in South Africa. Um, and at that point, you know, before 1992, um, essentially, the, uh, the ANC had one policy, which was to kind of change the government. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, when it moved into a situation where it was going to move into government inevitably in, in, in sort of 1994, there was a big scramble to like, figure out what the policies were for everything else in the country, like health and telecoms and all the other stuff that you kind of need to have if you're going to be a government running a country. And so the, the, the task that I was involved in was how did we actually want to define telecoms and, and information technology and policy for, for a country. Um, we had to kind of put all that together in 24 months so that the, 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 the government would have an agenda. And the process we went through to do that was actually a scenario building process. We kind of examined uh, you know, what, the, what the state of the country would, w was likely to be uh, and the state of the environment of the country uh, over a 20 year time frame, um, looked at that context of that and, and then worked backwards as to what the policy interventions were that could be made in, um, in, in the period of 1994 through sort of 2000 that would have an effect that would manifest itself now um, in, this, in this time frame. And, uh, and that process of thinking backwards and learning how to build scenarios and so on was very influential for me. Um, and I've, I've subsequently applied that in, in the way that I've been going about building businesses. And that's really based around this notion of searching for inevitabilities. So there's a tremendous amount of noise and opinion around uh, you know, developmental trends, and that can be pretty confusing. Um, and it's important to distinguish you know, what are the ultimate outcomes that you can regard as, as an inevitabilities or, 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 or pretty, pretty much close to, to certainty. So we've, you know, we have an entire industry in, in, uh, in the technology world based around Moore's law and that, you know, that as a guiding principle of, of certainty. Um, but there are, other, there are other things that we can bet on uh, than that. You know, we can bet on Mevskov's law, we can bet on the fact that per capita uh, kilobit demand in mobile networks is going to continue to grow at a certain, at a certain rate, um, essentially driven by megapixel rates on, 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 uh, on cameras, right? And there are, there are other inevitabilities that we can, that we can, that we can uh, identify. So, you know, in the context of, of the cloud, um, the, the inevitability that, uh, that, we, that we placed a bet on was, was the emergence of the mobile internet, which back in 2000, 2001, wasn't necessarily a certainty at that, at that point, right? Um, nobody had figured out how to get 3G uh, networks working effectively. Um, and within the context of the mobile internet, we placed a bet on a specific technology, which was Wi-Fi technology. Um, and the insight that those were right, the right things to bet on as, as emerging market spaces you know, arose from a whole set of scenarios that had very little to do with 
technology. I mean, some of it was to do with technology trends and, and, uh, uh, and you know, fundamentals of the science of technology, but a hell of a lot of it had to do with the environmentals of the market space uh, uh, as it would be developing over, over, over the next couple of years. I don't expect you to ingest all of that. But that scenario thinking process really identified uh, you know, a number of, of inevitabilities and a number of kind of critical uncertainties and, and, and specifically point, pinpointed Wi-Fi technology as a, as, 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 as a role player that was being largely under, un, un, underappreciated. That combined with um, some, some, direct, uh, uh, some direct work, so this is a photograph taken from my favorite cafe in Amsterdam of my apartment which is in the, the building on the, on, the, uh, on the right there at the edge of the canal. So about approximately about 200 meters away. Um, and uh, so in 2000, 2001, I kind of set up a Wi-Fi access point from my cable connection in my apartment to my favorite cafe on the other side of the canal. Gave myself two megabits worth of, of access uh, in my favorite coffee shop, which was, uh, which was a proof point to me that, uh, that actually there was going to be, it was being possible to build, you know, meaningful network access with that, with that technology. But, you know, essentially uh, an insight about the, you know, the development curve of the market and, you know, a, a view that um, this technology was, was open, it was global in terms of its, uh, its spectrum allocation and its technology footprint. Um, that there'd be a proliferation of devices simply because of the reduction of cost of the technology um, and uh, in general in terms of device technology and that you know, growing per capita uh, bandwidth usage would drive up indoor uh, uh, mobile data demand. So we take for granted today that you, know, you can walk into a McDonald's or a Starbucks and, and, uh, and leverage a, a, a data connection. Um, that's, that's essentially because you know, the dynamics of, uh, of, of network access mean that indoor coverage is something that we all, that we all crave. So those insights uh, emerged from, from a scenario process and allowed, allowed us to, uh, to identify business opportunity and, and found that based upon the, the interests of some of those stakeholders. So the device manufacturers had a vested interest in access to network. The, uh, the, uh, the location providers had a, had a vested interest in, uh, in, in, in access. Essentially, you know, the McDonald's of the world would uh, would see digital space as uh, as part of their uh, their retail experience, and, uh, and and therefore those were those were driving opportunities. So coming back to coming back to everything, really the 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 insights behind everything are based upon uh, the the inevitabilities. I would argue that no physical product um, is going to exist in isolation. Um, as we, as we move forward. Every product uh, that we deploy is part of uh, a, a digital context. Um, we take this for granted with websites that we build. Almost every website built in the world is a mashup of content and elements pulled from other sources. And that notion of mashing in digital content terms starts to apply to, to physical products. Um, no physical product is, is, is going to consist solely of its actually standalone components. It's a combination of digital data, algorithm, cloud, and the physical manifestation. Secondly, that the web is a global platform of integration. It is the global interconnection environment. It's the, it's the context of application usage. Uh, and therefore, it's, its language, its protocols, its method of inter, interworking, its data exchange methodologies are, are, uh, are the lowest common denominator of, of, of interworking between physical products. And lastly, that, that therefore products become part of the web. Um, and in order for any single product to, to work, it has to be uh, uh, operating as natively as possible in that, in that environment of the web. So whether we're, you know, we're seeing battles between different ecosystems, obviously, but essentially uh, we're, those ecosystems exist within this broader context of the web. So those are inevitabilities that, uh, that we're placing a bet on. And so, you know, effectively in every business I've created, I've had a sort of an idealistic vision that's sitting at the, at the heart of it. Here it's about, in everything, it's about every single physical product in the world having an identity on the web and therefore providing the technological capability to fulfill that. How does it have an identity on the web? Um, one goes through this incredibly messy process, which I'm sure many of you have been in the room here, trying to figure out what uh, a clean execution strategy is to realize that, uh, that, that, that vision. Um, and, and seeking out uh, what I call ir ir irrational irrationalists, basically. Who are the allies 
in the market space that, that can relate to that vision and can relate to those inevitabilities of the future. Basically, you have a stake in the disruption that that change of, of the emerging environment represents and therefore are your logical partners. Um, and uh, those might be device manufacturers, as in the case of, of building the mobile internet environment, or retail providers, as in the case of building, building the mobile internet environment. In the Internet of Things, we see device manufacturers, we see consumer brands um, uh, as, uh, as allies in this emerging space, because at last, the ability for products to directly interact in real time with their customers allows product manufacturers the ability to, uh, to, to just intermediate the, uh, the retail that's intermediating them and that's a that's a powerful set of allies so that's hopefully an insight as to is to a process of thinking backwards really visualizing very richly the future environment that uh, that 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 that, a, that, a, that we're going to be operating in identifying the innovation opportunities that enabled that future environment a plausible future environment and then really figuring out how we got there um, and that path of figuring out how, how we got there is how, how I've, I've really gone through the process of, of identifying uh, new business opportunities and developing new business opportunities the path isn't going to be linear um, and indeed it may it may involve some steps that one doesn't know how to accomplish um, and uh, um, you know for example you know we're placing a bet on reducing cost of uh, computation or storage or, or the existence of a of a throughput capability with a wireless protocol that doesn't yet exist and those are bets that one simply has to has to make if the plausibility of that future environment is uh, is, is is compelling enough and has some faith that they'll emerge I talk about jumping out of an airplane with a power Parachute kit, and making the parachute before you hit the ground. Right, that's the that's the trick. But you know, the the important thing I think is to have a great deal of confidence in that future vision uh, and stick with it with those uh, with those uncertainties. Perhaps varying the implementation strategy as one as one moves along. Um, and the confidence in that future vision really comes from uh, from a real analysis of what that future world state looks like. That's what I wanted to share. Thank you. <laughs> no, I think that the you know the the it's a demanding process raising raising uh, raising capital in this market because whilst there's a tremendous amount of noise around the Internet of Things, um, you know very few businesses have actually proven scale, um, the ability to access scale, and uh, I'd say that's that's the. That has been the biggest challenge to 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 substantiate. Um, you know, 24 months ago, 36 months ago, nobody knew what the Internet of Things was. Um, so it was tougher to raise actually a, a, an early stage round than it was to raise a Series A round um, right now. And I think at, right now we sit in a point where the market is really accelerating. Um, the ability to move to scale is there because the large pan product manufacturing brands and consumer brands are, are starting to act. And, uh, um, and so now it becomes actually, a, to some degree, a competition not just of technology but of, of capital resource to be able to respond to that scale. Well, I, I guess to clarify maybe a little bit more about what I mean by that is, is the the concept that if you if if a product is connected into the digital environment, if I take that sim simple thing like a smart plug, um, that its value proposition isn't the fact that it's a plug, its value proposition is the fact that it's a plug that I can connect to other appliances and that I can connect to multiple applications that I might want to have to control that plug. And so it exists in a context of, of connectivity. And, uh, 
And those mashups might be structured in the sense that there are 10 applications that that smart plug can work with, and that's great. But they also might be incredibly ad hoc because you know I decide that I want to program my home, you know, with Ift to work with something else. And and uh, I, I think we're moving into an environment where essentially every product has to be an API. Um, because that's going to define its, increasingly define its utility. Um, and actually, you can't know what all the applications that your products are going to be put to. So that, that's what's interesting to me, is the, is the fact that, that the design definition of what a product is, is uh, and can be is no longer static, right? It's a, it's a dynamic thing. You know, I'm going to sound like a Bruce Sterling groupie here, right? But, but, he, um, but he postulated this concept of a spine, which I don't know if people are familiar with, but to say that a physical object is no longer just a static entity, right? In fact, it's never the same thing at any moment in time because it's a combination of computation, of data, of obviously mechanical characteristics, um, but actually it's also just a node in, a, uh, in, in, a, in an ad hoc network of things. And that how, how those can be made to very, very easily be formed, those ad hoc networks, that's what interests me the most. So our competition falls into two categories, you know, very large enterprise software companies, the IBMs of the world, um, because we're predominantly, our customers are predominantly large manufacturers, um, and it also comprises very specific vertical providers who might be solving a specific type of, type of problem. Um, we differentiate, on, I guess, on, on, on three primary characteristics. One is, um, is the web, in the sense that uh, the, uh, we want to make products as intimate and, and native to the web as possible so that you can work with them as web assets and therefore any programmer in the world any application in the world can, can integrate and connect with a product at the lowest possible cost, basically, by, by commoditizing its, its integration using web technology. Secondly, in terms of data management, so ownership of data is critical to any product manufacturer. And there's a, essentially a competitive dynamic whereby, uh, you know, various providers will want to own the data set from your products and uh, and obviously we would advocate an environment where that is not the case that that uh, that you know wherefore we're a data manager um, and I guess thirdly is the um, uh, the uh, um, yeah, just the, simply the issues of scale because it's it's pretty easy to solve the problem of connecting a hundred light bulbs or a thousand light bulbs right it's not that easy to solve the problem of connecting a hundred million light bulbs and ensuring that when somebody hits an on off switch you know that they switch on and off within 60 milliseconds right um, because there's a serious scale to that environment and uh, and and so in terms of hardcore computational capability to operate connected products at high scale and that's that's where the rubber meets the road wonderful thank you thank you